Welcome to GTS Car Life, I'm Thomas. Today, I'm gonna to share with you some of my favorite models from my model car collection. I have about 150 cars right now and growing every day. To me, each of these cars bring back certain memories and there's certain stories I remember with each car. I'm gonna share the cars and those stories with you today. So, you know, they say save the best for last, but in this case, I'm actually starting off with my favorite. This car is by far the most incredibly detailed, well-assembled model car I, I own, and you know, the most amazing one I've seen. I'm sure that there are others that are uh, as fantastic, maybe even more so, but this car from CMC, this Porsche 901, so the first 82 911s were called 901s, the detail here is just incredible. The seats fold forward on their hinges like it's supposed to. The paint color is accurate. The interior, you can take the wheels off. The car comes with a lug wrench and you can actually take all those little, five little lug nuts off. They actually turn off and you can take the wheel off. It's a stamped steel wheel. I mean, the detailing is incredible. I mean, who does that besides CMC? If I were to be shrunk down to a 118th version of me, this would be the car I would want to drive. Everything works, and this thing weighs a ton. I mean, it is a solid metal car. I wish all of them were built like this. This is my Jaguar E-Type Coupe. This is the car that Enzo Ferrari was famously quoted as saying it was the most beautiful car uh, ever designed uh, in the history of cars at the time. It is very unique, uh, and like so many, really emotional special cars uh, had a lot of flaws your feet got toasted anywhere you drove really really hot in the engine compartment really hot in the footwells the passenger compartment um, but you know who cares it just looks so incredible it's just a stunning beautiful car it's like nothing else out there from the incredibly long front the way the hood tilts up the odd side hinged rear hatch um, the tiny little doors. This car is very unique. I always love any car that is unique and special. Uh, I like different things, and this one certainly is different. Yeah, I had to have I had to have this one. This is the BMW M1. I remember when this car came out. I actually was fortunate to see one at uh, Euro Motorcars in Bethesda, Lamborghini had a hand in helping BMW with this, their, their very first ever, and I think still only, supercar. So this was considered to be the first kind of practical, relatively reliable, easy to drive supercar. The Lamborghinis and Ferraris and other supercars of the time, they were very temperamental, some of them still are, very temperamental and uh, you know not really something you can daily drive. And the M1 was designed to be like a BMW, but with a amazing supercar body, the engine that would eventually power the M5, and just an incredible car. This was also designed by my favorite designer of all time, Giorgetto. Giorgiaro was, uh, in my opinion, and he's still alive, in my opinion, he's the greatest automotive designer of all time. He's done cars from the Volkswagen Golf, Scirocco, the M1, the DeLorean, Hyundais, I mean, just uh, an entire incredible array of designs. And uh, he, he is the master. I would love to meet him one day, but that's probably not gonna happen. So this is the DeLorean. I actually did a review of one for my high school newspaper, and, um, and I was not impressed. The quality of the car was just horrendous. And in fact, this 118 scale model is much better built than the actual 1-1 DeLorean was. John DeLorean was an incredible automotive engineer and uh, really a, a pioneer in many ways. It, he, he was credited with the concept for the Pontiac GTO. He really turned around Pontiac division. He was the youngest vice president in the history of uh, Pontiac, and I believe General Motors, and uh, really was, a, was kind of a renegade. And, took some extreme measures to bring some high-performance cars into the 
otherwise conservative General Motors fold. And uh, he left, supposedly before he was about to be fired. But he left and he wrote a book called uh, On a Clear Day You Can See General Motors. It was not a very positive book and it resulted in claims that he was being blackballed by General Motors and that a lot of suppliers that he wanted to use when he was building his own car, uh, a lot of suppliers were told by General Motors, if you supply John DeLorean, we will stop doing business with you. So uh, that probably happened. So this is my Aston Martin Vantage. I, uh, I've always been a fan of the older Aston Martins. The, the newer ones are beautiful, but frankly, there's just too many of them out there. Uh, a lot of exotic cars today are too common. You just see them everywhere, so it takes away from the uniqueness. I've always appreciated how this car, it looks like it's not trying too hard. Some of today's cars are trying too hard with their styling. This one, yeah, there's a bit of, you know, 60s Mustang fast back in the styling, but definitely a more grown up, serious British version of that. If I had a real collection of full scale cars, this would definitely be one of those cars. And who doesn't love a red interior? So this is the Porsche 924. I was never a fan of the Porsche 924. It just didn't look aggressive enough to me. I, I wasn't really a fan of the, the really sleek and thin styling. Uh, clearly the, the Audi four cylinder engine, you know, wasn't really impressive. I didn't really, uh, you know, appreciate it or want the car. But looking back, I understand the significance of the 924 in Porsche history. And without the 924, there would be no 944. And I love the 944. I really wish Porsche would build a, a modern day, you know, front mid engine 944, but that's not gonna happen. It's cheaper for them to just to build cars on the 911 and uh, 718 platform. This one has a crazy uh, posh interior which even when the posh interiors were on the showroom floors, I, I wasn't, uh, wasn't a huge fan of them. I admire that they're different. I like to see companies trying, but uh, it wouldn't be something I could live with. So here it is, the Porsche 944, one of the greatest Porsches, uh, in my opinion, still. They just really nailed it with this car. The styling is outstanding. It looks like a race car for the street. Uh, they made the, the rear spoiler much larger, kind of reminiscent of the 930 uh, whale tail. This one has the phone dial wheels. I'm also a big fan of the Fuchs wheels. But as you may know, I have a 944, uh, which my son drives, and that car gets more compliments, more stares, more looks, more likes on Instagram uh, than any car I can think of, including my own 997 GTS. People just love the 944, and I understand why. It's, it's just a great looking, unique Porsche. This one being the turbo has the smoothed over front end. I've looked everywhere for a naturally aspirated version, but uh, can't seem to find one. So here's the Porsche 928. This car was a massive program for Porsche. They spent millions and millions of dollars. This was supposed to replace the 911, which was the old air-cooled rear engine design that Porsche felt at that time had really run its course and that there was nothing else they could do with the car. So I remember there was a huge media push uh, for the 928 back in the day. In fact, um, Magnum P.I. was supposed to be driving a Porsche 928, ends up with a Ferrari instead, and you know, I'm sure that Porsche wishes that they had uh, made things work in the 928. But the Hardy Boys did drive a 928 in the television adaptation of the book series. And I always enjoyed reading the Hardy Boys books. So uh, when the TV show came out and they were driving a 928, that, that was pretty cool. And of course, you know, who doesn't remember uh, Tom Cruise in Risky Business with the Porsche 928 uh, and the service manager asking who the U-boat captain was. Yeah, Guido the Killer Pimp. 
And it was quite unlike anything else that Porsche had ever done. It was, uh, it, <laughs> it's so funny, because the car back then, it, it got criticized for being too big and heavy. And, uh, you know, it did seem like that compared to a 911, but, uh, and a 924, 914. But, you know, today, my gosh, it's a lot smaller than the 911s of today. So, um, that's interesting. What a great looking car. Today, the GTS model is worth a significant amount of money. So this is a Lotus Esprit. This was the first generation of Lotus Esprit. Uh, again, designed by my favorite designer, uh, Giorgio. Just uh, an incredible designer. And this car has clearly stood the test of time. This is just an incredible looking car. I, I've always uh, had an appreciation for Lotus. I, I just can't deal with being stuck on the side of the road with the electrical problems and, and shoddy uh, build quality. So I, I don't own a Lotus and uh, probably never will, but I certainly appreciate what they can do. And I'm really glad that they're built. They're pretty cool cars. And I think today Lotus probably remains one of the very few companies that is still very true to its original uh, intent. So a Lotus, you know, you're not buying it because it's the status symbol or because it's luxurious or, you know, you buy a Lotus because it's like a track car uh, that you can drive on the street. And it, to this day, you know, somebody that drives a Lotus, that's a real car guy. So I, I hear they have an SUV coming along that might change. But at this point, they are still very pure and uh, um, just really cool cars. I need to drive one of these cars. So this is one of the final years of the Lotus Esprit. Uh, the body, while it looks the same as the original ones, actually was extensively massaged by a uh, lesser known designer who took Jaro's work and rounded off the edges. The old folded paper, creased kind of styling from the 70s uh, had given way to a more rounded look like this in the 80s and 90s and so, uh, I think they did a good job with it. It's still Jaro's work, but you know the edges were rounded off, and uh, I think they pulled it off, made the car still viable for the second part of its very long production run. I'm not a fan of add-on plastic spoilers, so the rear wing spoiler and some of the uh, side skirts, they're a little bit overdone for me, but still quite an impressive looking car. I think those taillights came from a Toyota Celica, if I'm not mistaken. So here we have, in my opinion, one of the absolute most beautiful cars ever designed. There's a very interesting story with the Lamborghini Miura. The previous Lamborghini had been a front engine GT car, similar to the Ferrari Daytona. And this car was put together by a group of very young people within Lamborghini who really wanted to go more of a mid-engine race car type deal. Uh, and Ferruccio Lamborghini was not a fan of that. He said, no, I want to stay in this kind of GT mode, but they put this car together and uh, word has it that when he saw what they had come up with, uh, he signed on and you know, the rest is history. I mean, what an incredible, beautiful car. Nothing else looked like it before or since. And uh, you know, these are very, very valuable, very desirable cars. This model here is produced by AutoArt. Uh, you may notice on this car, this was an earlier auto art and there's no side mirrors. They, uh, they didn't put side mirrors on the earlier models like this and the Countach that I've got. Uh, and whenever I get a car today in, in, in the mail and it's uh, one of the mirrors broken off, I can understand why they did that, but um, the newer ones do have mirrors. And, but what a beautiful car. Here is the Lamborghini Countach. This is the early version of the Lamborghini Countach and uh, the most pure. It's the narrow body, doesn't have any of the added on fender flares or the extroverted styling that Pagani would uh, do to the car later on. But uh, just a truly unique, incredible looking car. Can you imagine? This thing looked like a flying doorstop back in the day. And of course, we all saw it in the movie Cannonball Run. I remember seeing one of these when I was a kid. I saw it parked in a, in a lot and walked up to it and the, the build quality was really horrible. It was not a well-engineered or assembled vehicle. And I remember as a 
teenager thinking, wow, you know, it's, I wasn't impressed because of how poorly built the car was. But, you know, all these years later, the styling is still just incredible. There's nothing like it. And, uh, and you really have to admire the people who put this thing together and, and the, the fellow who designed it. It's funny today when you see all kinds of cars with the Lambo doors and they see Dodge Magnums and Dodge Chargers driving around with Lambo doors. I've seen a couple Corvettes. I think Lambo doors are best left on Lambos. Um, that's why they're called Lambo doors, guys. So this is the Mark I Volkswagen GTI. This was my very first car. In fact, I had to have this model. I'm not a fan of Wellies models. They just, uh, you know, they're kind of a, a Toys R Us version of models to me. But I had to have this car because my very first car ever was a 1984 Volkswagen GTI Mark I. In the United States, they only sold the Mark I for 1983 and 84. The 84s had the bigger five mile per hour bumpers. The 83 had the smaller bumpers, the 2.5 mile per hour bumpers. I used to drive my GTI from my home outside of Washington, DC up to uh, New Jersey to visit a girlfriend I had at the time. And up on the turnpike, you know, anything over 100 miles an hour, the side windows would start to pull away from the frame, which was always exciting. And then after cruising over 100 miles an hour, uh, the oil temperature gauge would always indicate that I was up in the red. So after cruising, you know, 100, 102, 105 for an extended period, you had to kick it back down to about 75 miles per hour, let the oil temperature come back down and then go back on your way again. So this is the Renault R5 Turbo, another car that really caught my attention back in the day. I followed the Renault Elf F1 team. Their colors were yellow and black, just like this car is yellow and black. This is a, a Gerard LaRousse uh, Tribute R5 Turbo. He raced for Renault and he also raced for Porsche. I wanted this car so bad. Even though it was never sold in America legally, there was a gray market. And so people would buy them bring them over and do a few little things, maybe change the headlights, maybe put a door beam in, maybe not. And I think they were about $25,000 back in the day. So my GTI was 9,180, a 944 was in real life, eh, 25,000 to 27. And this car was about 25,000 gray market. But being that I worked at a Renault dealership, I was intimately familiar with the reliability or lack thereof in uh, Renault. And I thought it was best, I just admire it from afar. One day, some guy came in with his R5 Turbo. Uh, it was bright red, and I got to admire it in the service shop. And to this day, man, I see this car, and I just, I get a nostalgic twinge, and these are, these are really cool cars. So this is another Renault. This is the Renault Alpine A310. This is another uh, rear engine sports car, like the 911. So today, nobody in their right mind, in fact, nobody, that would build a car is gonna make a rear engine sports car, uh, besides Porsche, of course, who doesn't have a choice. <laughs> but Renault did it back in this time. So this is a rear engine sports car. The earlier Alpines had the very kind of round bubbly bodies and the current day Alpine also has a very round bubbly body, but I really like the wedge style of this kind of a comeback style. It reminds me a little bit of the AMC Gremlin. Never a fan of Gremlin, but I do love American Motors styling. In fact, I, uh, I was always a huge fan of Richard Teague. Always hoped I could meet the man. And so definitely I can see elements of American Motors and the Gremlin styling in this car. Pretty cool looking car. I mean, look at that back end spoiler. It looks really aggressive and it looks purposeful. It also reminds me a lot of the AMC AMX. This is the oldest model in my collection. I saw this car when it first came out and fell in love with it. And uh, actually my mom bought this for me. It was a gift from my mother. It's in the traditional Bugatti blue. When the company who built this car, they bought the rights to continue Bugatti as a brand. And they spent a fortune on an incredible factory. Uh, built a stunning factory for this car. Did an incredible job on the styling and the engine and this car was really uh, done right, but they spent all their money getting the car to production. So by the time they finally started production, they really had no money left to build the car. So they designed this amazing factory, an amazing design, and then they ran out of money. and They built very few cars. It was never really appreciated. I think today it's starting to get some respect, no doubt aided by the fact that you know, there's a, again, a third version of Bugatti, 
uh, run by Volkswagen with the Veyron and the Chiron. And, um, but this car is really cool. Thank you for watching and come along for the ride. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and liking below so you won't miss our next episode. Let me know in the comments below what is your most special model car and what does it mean to you. Have fun, stay safe, and I'll see you out there.